Good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday morning. Thanks for joining uh, Miller Johnson's 8 a.m. webinar this morning. This is Sarah Willey, and I'm here with my colleague, Sandy Andre, and we're going to be talking this morning about um, uh, creating and implementing uh, the COVID-19 preparedness and response plan that's required under the most recent executive order, that's executive order 42, um, and that's also the stay at home order that Governor Whitmer issued last Thursday. So thanks for joining us. Um, I wanted to kick it off with a little good news um, because I think we all we all could use a little good news uh, these days. So, so I went and picked up a few items for you guys. Number one, um, Governor, Whitmer did announce in her press conference yesterday that it looks like, um, at least in Michigan, the COVID-19 curve is starting to flatten. Um, so it's feeling like maybe we're headed in the right direction here, guys. Um, and then secondarily, um, the uh, Treasury Department announced that individuals may have stimulus checks in their hands and in their banks um, by tomorrow, by April 15th. So, so that's a second piece of good news for you all. Um, so the way we're going to run this webinar today is Sandy is going to take the lead on doing the presentation, and then I'm going to sit back and watch and answer questions as they come in. So we will take a break um, partway through the webinar, and then also I will be answering questions at the end. So thank you again for joining it joining us. And with that, I'll kick it off to Sandy. Excellent. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Sarah mentioned, our topic this morning is specifically is pretty narrow. It's related to the COVID-19 preparedness and response plan uh, requirements that are now required under Executive Order 42. Um, so we will talk a little bit about what is new in that executive order and what is not new. And then we will turn to a couple of pretty important resources um, that you should be relying upon to draft your preparedness and response plans. And then we'll spend some time going through um, our recommendation for what a, a framework framework for your preparedness and response plan can look like. Okay, next slide, please. So let's first uh, take a couple of minutes and talk about um, Executive Order 42, the updated stay at home order, as Sarah mentioned, that Governor Whitmer issued last Thursday. And so we want to be clear that there are a number of requirements here for in-person operations that are not new to this order. They were the same requirements that existed in the previous stay-at-home order, uh, Order 21. And so I just want to review those. If you are currently um, continuing in-person operations in any capacity, these are pieces that you should already be doing or implementing. So you should already be restricting the number of workers present on the premises to no more than strictly necessary. You should already be promoting remote work to the fullest extent possible. You should already be keeping workers and patrons who are on the premises at least six feet from one another to the maximum extent possible. And that includes uh, for those of you who are who are serving customers who may come into the workplace, um, designating um, some social distancing uh, measures for customers who are standing in line. Next slide, please. Also not new, increasing standards of facility cleaning and disinfection to limit worker and patron exposure, as well as adopting protocols to clean and disinfect in the event of a positive uh, COVID-19 case in the workplace. And last week, two of our colleagues, Patrick Edzinga and Matt O'Rourke, uh, completed a webinar specifically on a protocol in the event you had an individual test positive in your workplace. So I would refer you to the nuts and bolts of that webinar as well. And then the last piece here, um, not new, um, or excuse me, two more, adapting policies to prevent workers from entering the premises if they display respiratory symptoms or have had contact with a person who's known or suspected to have COVID-19. A number of you who may be listening um, may be under um, a requirement to be doing that already outside of the executive, this particular executive order. Um, for example, there are a number of counties in Michigan um, whose, whose public health 
department have said um, any uh, workplaces that are operating with in person um, operations uh, right now must be undergoing some kind of assessment or questionnaire of their employees um, or or customers, clients, patients um, on, on a daily basis um, to screen for anyone who may um, be experiencing uh, COVID-19 related symptoms or have had close contact with somebody who is. So some of you may already be doing that um, as a requirement under those orders, but the executive order contemplates um, that uh, the rest of us should be thinking about that as well. And next slide, please. And the last piece um, that is not new, uh, any other social distancing practices and mitigation me uh, measures recommended by the CDC. And of course, uh, those, those are numerous, right? So um, talking about implementing uh, flexible work sites, telework where you can, flexible hours such as staggered shifts or new shifts increasing physical space between employees at the work site so where you can um, i think before we've talked about um, implementing zoning right in the work area um, as you have employees who who remain on site uh, limiting the areas in the workplace that they can go to to only those places that are necessary for them to perform um, their jobs and of course uh, enter and exit uh, implementing flexible meeting and travel options, downsizing operations where you can, and uh, contemplating delivery, uh, service delivery in a remote um, or kind of uh, curbside pickup or delivery setup. So all of those uh, aspects of Executive Order 42 as it relates to the measures that in-person operations should be contemplating, those are not new. Those existed in Executive Order 21. So now let's turn to uh, one of the new requirements under Executive Order 42 as it relates to um, organizations who continue in-person operations. And so that's what we're here to talk about today. Developing a COVID-19 preparedness and response plan that is consistent with the recommendations in uh, the OSHA document that is cited here called Guidance on Preparing Workplaces for COVID-19. So the good news here, Sarah started out with some good news. I'll, I'll keep on that, uh, that theme. The good news here is if you're continuing in-person activities, it is very likely that you are already doing much of what this new item in the executive order now requires, right? Um, because you have already had to think about all of these things or certainly contemplate all of these things. So the new requirement is really just a requirement now to take the time to get everything that you're already doing documented and in one place, okay? So, so that's the good news. Hopefully um, this is more, um, an exercise in, in coordinating paperwork than necessarily thinking about um, any of these contingencies because you're already doing that. You've already done that most likely. What's important to remember, there may be a number of people on the call right now who do not currently have, um, who are not currently operating any in-person operations, right? So perhaps um, your organization is entirely remote right now, but if, if your organization uh, plans to bring back any in-person activities before this stay at home order. So before uh, executive order 42 expires at the end of the month, you will need to put this plan in place. So for, for those of us who are entirely remote, you're not totally off the hook. You wanna keep this in the back of your mind. Um, and as you continue to evaluate how you are delivering services, um, that you keep this uh, top of mind so you know that when you do return to in-person work, if this stay-at-home order is still in place, you will be required to implement a plan as well. And the last piece here is uh, I want to be clear that uh, this plan does need to be a, a physical, um, you know, a, a document that you have available at your company headquarters or a work site, um, particularly uh, contemplating um, if, if someone from an enforcement standpoint comes and asks if you have one, you have something readily available to, to provide to them. So uh, it does need to be, um, it does need to be somewhere in your organization. Again, all of the pieces that you've already been doing compiled in, in one location. Next slide, please. 
So now let's turn to what the OSHA guidance um, tells us. So as we look at that guidance, um, OSHA tells us that a proper plan should contain a number of pieces. So uh, a handful of critical pieces here. Number one, the, a plan should outline and help guide the protective actions that the organization is taking against COVID-19 in the workplace. So let's just quickly unpack that a little bit. So when it talks about outlining the protective actions, essentially you're wanting to just say, what are we currently doing and what do we expect you employees to do or um, you managers and supervisors to do, right? So if this document exists, you, in, in theory, you would want um, employees in your organization, if something happened related to COVID-19, to turn to this plan and there would be a document in the plan that would tell them uh, what to do to deal with whatever contingency um, is facing them. Um, in terms of Again, outlining the piece in number one there about helping guide your actions. What actions are we going to take if our workplace is exposed, if our business operations are interrupted, et cetera. So, so that's what number one is getting at there. Number two, include a mechanism for how the organization plans to stay abreast of guidance, <clears throat> excuse me, from federal, state, local health agencies and how it will incorporate those recommendations and resources into its workplace plans. So related to number two, the CDC actually recommends, as, as do we, and, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but identifying a workplace coordinator um, at your organization who is the person responsible for COVID-19 issues and their impact at the workplace. So somebody who is responsible for monitoring um, the, the changing guidance, um, especially as we're certainly in a very fluid situation here um, as guidance from the CDC um, and OSHA uh, may change related to this pandemic. So tapping somebody and identifying them in your plan who that person is responsible um, for staying abreast of those changes. Next slide, please. Number three. OSHA guidance requires or says that a plan should consider and address the levels of risk associated with various work sites and job tasks. And um, so needing to consider and address those level of risk, not just by location. So, you know, hypothetically, we have one location and this is what we think, uh, you know, the risk levels are, but also drilling down and looking a little bit more by job tasks. Do you have folks in your organization who are at a higher level of risk um, related to the type of work and contact with the public um, or potentially infected persons than somebody else who is continuing on-site operations? So drilling down to that, to that level. So where, how, and what sources of COVID-19 employees may be exposed to, identifying non-occupational risk factors at home and in community settings, taking into account workers' individual risk factors, and taking into account controls that may be necessary to address those risks. So taking a look at the, the sources of risk that may touch, uh, for lack of a better term, right, um, your workplace, either what your workers individually have exposure to inside and outside of the workplace or what your work naturally um, lends itself to from, from an exposure standpoint. Next slide, please. And the fourth recommendation from um, OSHA in terms of the fourth component um, that a preparedness plan should contain, um, developing contingency plans for various situations such as increased rates of worker absenteeism. So making sure that you have um, sick leave policies in place that are consistent with public health guidance and updated workplace laws. For those listening to this call and who have listened to um, our webinars over the last couple of weeks, you, you certainly know that we have a number um, of, we have an updated executive order that talks about um, protections employees have for missing work related to COVID-19 um, symptoms, and we have new federal laws that, that protect and pay employees for 
for time away from work related to COVID-19 um, issues. So making sure um, that your organization is, is developing plans um, for, for those pieces. Developing contingency plans for um, increased social distancing um, if and when um, that is that is needed, depending on community spread or potential um, exposure in your workplace. Options for conducting essential operations with a reduced workforce, thinking about cross-training workers across different jobs, right, in order to continue operations or to deliver um, surge services, right? So if you're a critical infrastructure organization, um, your, your services may be needed now more than ever. And so perhaps you've ramped up. It seems like maybe the rest of the world is ramping down, but perhaps you're ramping up. And so um, contemplating and developing contingency plans to accommodate um, to think about how you would accommodate that and thinking about um, a contingency plan for interrupted supply chains or delayed deliveries so identifying alternative uh, supply chains knowing that some goods and services may become unavailable um, perhaps uh, those organizations are ramping down right perhaps they're not running or perhaps they're in such high demand that that's the reason they're unavailable so building within your plan um, contingencies to address situations uh, just like that. At this point, we'll take a short pause and see if we have um, any questions we can address. Thanks, Sandy. Yep, we sure do. Um, the first one I want to address actually does not um, have anything to do with this presentation, but I, I want to answer it anyway because I've um, – gotten um, other emails from clients asking this this question so um, and that is did the executive order the newest stay-at-home executive order somehow automatically create WARN Act obligations for businesses in Michigan um, and I think the um, the cause of this confusion might be an email from the Michigan Economic Development Corporation that on its face seemed to imply that that's the case. Um, so I want to say that the executive order did not automat did, did not do anything to automatically trigger um, businesses' obligation to send WARN Act notices to its employees who are on furlough or temporary layoff. I, I think the intention of the Michigan e Economic Development Incorporation was to remind you all that layoffs that exceed six months are considered a loss of employment, um, which then that can trigger WARN Act obligations. Um, and I think the point they were trying to make is that now that this order has been extended, pay attention to how long your layoffs are lasting because that may trigger the WARN Act for you all. Okay, so let's turn back to this, this presentation. I've gotten a couple of questions along the same theme, and that is, can employees request a copy of this plan and or should we hand it out to our employees? Um, and I think the answer to that question depends on <clears throat> how you draft and craft your own plan. Um, I don't mind the idea at all, quite frankly, of making this plan available to employees. And quite frankly, you probably do want to write it in such a way so that if employees ask for a copy of it, um, you would feel comfortable showing it to them. In these times, um, it's, it, it's hard for me to imagine um, a circumstance in which an employee would ask for a copy of your COVID-19 preparedness plan, and you would want to say no to that employee. Um, but a, as you write it then with an eye toward making it available to employees, if that's what you want to do, um, be mindful not to overstate what you are going to do or promises you're going to make. Um, in other words, use words like if needed, right, or consider um, doing certain things rather than having a plan say things have been done or are certainly going to be done. 
then you avoid employees coming back and questioning why why your plan says that certain measures are, are going to be taken when they have not been taken. Um, another question is, is a business that employs critical infrastructure workers required to develop one of these plans? And the answer is yes. If you have in-person work, then um, your business has to have one of these plans. Now, I would say in-person work means some sort of regular in-person work. Um, probably uh, if you are an organization that just has one of your um, minimum, uh, it, one of your employees going in uh, once in a while to check on security, et cetera, um, we don't think that is necessarily in-person work. This is meant to apply to businesses that are actually operating on a regular basis. Um, Another question was, does it apply to small businesses under 10 employees or are they held to the same requirements? Unfortunately, yes. Um, there's no exception here for businesses of a certain number of employees. Um, I see questions coming in as I'm talking, so I'll answer some of those. We currently have a communicable disease awareness and control policy that outlines many of these items. Would this require an entirely separate policy or could we work COVID-19 into the current plan? My guess is you could easily work, use your current plan as your model for this and work COVID-19 into your existing um, communicable disease plan. Um, similar question, is the plan specific to COVID-19? or should it be written for any pandemic so that it can be used now or in the future? I would write it right now specific for COVID-19, um, maybe because I wanna be optimistic and say we're not going to have another global pandemic in, in our lifetimes, right? But, but if we did, I think if you wrote this one specific for COVID-19, it wouldn't be difficult then if you ever needed to, to take this plan and brush it off um, for another pandemic. Let's see if we, uh, if I can answer a few more questions that have come in. Oh, this is a very good question. What is the deadline this plan needs to be in place in writing? Well, technically the deadline was midnight on Thursday because that's when this executive order um, began um, and it's part of that executive order. From a practical standpoint, um, I'm, I'm guessing that if uh, my OSHA or OSHA asked for your plan, they would be understanding if it's taken you a little bit to get it implemented and written. However, I wouldn't delay in doing that. Um, do we have resources for a plan template or sample plan? Um, we do, we've put together um, sort of a template or framework um, for these plans, reach out to either Sandy or me, or if you have a different contact at Miller Johnson, that's fine too. Um, I will say that we created the template um, very, very broadly. Um, and so different industries will need to um, tweak it, take things out, et cetera, as they as some of it will apply to you and some of it will not apply to you. For example, um, we included information about customers um, and, and other pieces like that. Also, if you're a healthcare organization, we have an entirely separate template for you. Um, okay, let's answer one more question. Can OSHA cite you for not having a written plan in place? Well, that's a good question because we do anticipate that um, OSHA or the Michigan Enforcement Agency of OSHA, which is my OSHA, is probably going to be the governmental agency asking to see this plan. Um, and um, they could cite you um, under the general duty clause um, failure to protect your workers by not having a plan. 
Um, it is part of the OSHA guidance recommending it, and now our governor is telling businesses um, that they have to have it and saying it's a misdemeanor not to. So I would expect probably a citation from <clears throat> my OSHA if there was a safety concern from an employee and um, they asked for the plan and the business <clears throat> did not have anything to produce. Okay, so let's take, um, uh, Sandy, let's take, uh, let's talk a bit more and then I can keep watching these questions and at the end we will continue. Excellent, okay. So we've talked a little bit about what the OSHA guidance says a plan should contain. Now we'll go ahead and talk a little bit about um, what Miller Johnson recommends as a general framework. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, um, there are certainly industries that are going to require a little bit more or a little bit less detail in each of these areas. And so this is just a general framework for you to consider. Um, additionally, uh, quickly, I just wanted to mention, we will, um, obviously the webinar will be up on our page, but also the slides for this particular presentation. Um, we will make those available as well um, so that you have access to those, can print those off and kind of just work your way down the list um, as, you're, as you're working through your own plan, um, you know, as a checklist type of document. Do I have this? Do I have this? Yep, addressed it, addressed it, um, that kind of piece. So let's go ahead and talk Talk a little bit about what we think uh, uh, makes sense for a framework. So the first piece is um, wanting to identify the potential sources to spread COVID-19 in your workplace. So taking a look at the work um, that you are doing. So you're maintaining in-person operations. What type of work are you doing and what are uh, those likely sources? Is it um, just generally uh, related to um, because of the impact of community spread or is there something specific? Um, so are you, um, are you still open to the general public? Are you still having visitors and vendors come into your workplace? Obviously, um, each of us um, has a potential exposure um, by being around coworkers um, or depending on the type of work um, that we are doing, are we dealing with a high risk population as an example, right? If you are in healthcare or long-term care as an example, um, are, are other people like patients and residents, uh, folks that you are coming into contact with that could be potential sources of exposure. So that's the first piece. The second piece is you're going to want to identify the risk categories that exist in your organization related to uh, the types of employees you have. So our employees generally fall into the following categories of risk, right? So uh, lower exposure um, employees could be those who, um, according to the CDC guidance, um, that the work that those employees are performing does not require direct contact with people known or suspected to be infected with COVID-19 and does not require frequent close contact with the public. So those would be your lower risk, uh, lower exposure risk folks. Medium exposure risk employees, the work performed requires frequent or close contact with people who may be infected with COVID-19, but who are not known COVID-19 patients or the work requires contact with the general public in areas where there is ongoing community trans, uh, transmission, okay? Um, then high-risk exposure, we're talking about um, primarily folks um, who are dealing with healthcare delivery in some way. So healthcare delivery and support staff exposed to known or suspected COVID-19 patients, medical transport workers, moving known or suspected COVID-19 patients in enclosed vehicles, mortuary workers involved in preparing uh, bodies of persons who were known to have or were suspected of having COVID-19 at the time of death. Those are uh, workers that would fall into a high exposure category. And then a very high exposure risk category would be those healthcare workers who are performing 
uh, aerosol generating procedures on known or suspected COVID-19 patients, uh, laboratory personnel collecting or handling specimens from known or suspected COVID-19 patients, um, and uh, more workers performing autopsies uh, that generally involve kind of that aerosol generating procedures on bodies of uh, persons who were known or suspected to have uh, COVID-19 at the time of uh, at the time of their death. So those uh, that looks um, the type of risk categories that you'd want to analyze. What are the jobs in our workplace? Who is doing what? Generally, what are the risk exposure um, areas in our workplace? And certainly, some of you, um, it, it's likely that you would only have um, persons in your organization at in one of those risk categories, or you may have them in all four, depending on uh, your organization and the work that you are doing. Next slide, please. So also, oh, I skipped one area and I'll, I'll circle back to it, but we can stay here. We talked a little bit about this um, in the intro is identifying a workplace coordinator and why, why that is important. You'll want to put who that workplace coordinator is and you know, name of person or position, name, name of the position who's responsible for that makes a lot of sense. Again, we talked a little bit about wanting to identify somebody in your organization who is the person responsible for staying Staying on top of federal, state, local guidance and making sure that those recommendations are incorporated into your organization. So that person is um, the touch point to be monitoring those pieces, but responsible for reviewing organizational policies and practices to make sure that your organization's policies and practices are consistent with whatever that new guidance is. So in your plan, you'll want to specifically spell out who that who the person um, or position in your organization um, is that you've tapped to be that workplace coordinator. Okay. So the next piece of the plan is you'll want to delineate the responsibilities of um, individuals in your organization. So you'll first, of course, start with the responsibilities of, of your supervisors and managers. And of course, um, like all uh, policies that they are, are the face of, right, you're going to want to charge them to being familiar with the plan and being ready to answer questions uh, from your employees. Um, that's an important piece, but a, but a maybe equally or more important piece to that is these managers and supervisors need to, need to be the face of the plan, right? They need to be the ones setting a good example by following uh, the employee level responsibilities outlined in the plan at all times. And so we'll talk a little bit about what that is, but generally, right, when we talk about good personal hygiene, uh, general job site safety practices um, and prevention, strategies, social distancing, we need those managers and supervisors to really be living um, those pieces of this plan so that your employees understand that that is the expectation in, in your organization and they will be more likely to follow those, okay? So now let's talk a little bit about, uh, you'll wanna address the responsibilities, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, of your employees. And so first, you'll wanna talk to them generally about, um, what the control and prevent, preventative uh, guidance um, and requirements that you are um, you are implementing in your workplace, right? And so again, if I think back to the very first webinar we did on COVID-19 over a month ago now, we talked a little bit about um, what should you be communicating to your employees right now? And we said, hey, we should be talking to them um, about what the CDC is recommending in terms of hand hygiene um, and respiratory etiquette and, and pieces like that. And so um, if, if you did that and are doing that, that's a perfect uh, document, uh, right, to, to pull in, to pull into your plan here to talk about um, you know, CDC guidance recommends frequent hand washing, and, and this is what we consider our hand hygiene practices, um, respiratory etiquette, um, covering coughs and sneezes, avoid touching eyes, nose, mouth, um, avoid close contact with, with individuals who are sick, and maintain appropriate, <clears throat> excuse me, social distance of six feet whenever possible. So, so talking about all of those things and pulling in those communications you've already done or, or if they are ongoing, uh, tapping, tapping that as well. And then, of course, we'll want to educate our employees on the symptoms of COVID-19 and their exposure risks. 
So, um, you know, again, you've probably already done this. In fact, maybe you are using, uh, right, the poster uh, from the CDC or even your local health department that talks about COVID-19 symptoms, but uh, dry cough, uh, fever, feeling feverish or temperature of uh, 100.4 or higher, and shortness of breath or difficulty breathing are the general um, symptoms. Individuals, of course, um, with early symptoms can also have chills, body aches, uh, throat, headache, nausea, vomiting, runny nose, those pieces. So um, we want to make sure our employees are educated on what those symptoms are so that they can be um, on the lookout for them if they start to experiencing them. Um, and that can be a trigger um, for them to, you know, kind of raise their hand and saying, I, I think I'm experiencing these symptoms. Uh, hey, manager, you know, what do I do, right? And so the first thing that we should be um, communicating to those employees, um, if you develop symptoms or you're in close contact with someone with symptoms, um, you should not be reporting to work. You should report to your supervisor. Um, and then depending on the circumstances, right, um, our organization will work to identify employees who may have uh, had close contact with you. Now, um, Exec, uh, executive order from a couple of weeks ago um, that provides uh, uh, some uh, job protections for folks who are experiencing symptoms or who are in close contact with people with symptoms. Um, it's likely that that your um, right your staff are, are pretty educated on what those symptoms are and are already kind of on the lookout for this. But um, if you've done any kind of education um, or communication to your employees about those, go ahead and pull that in and make that a part of your plan. That, that works just perfect. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the next piece in the framework that you'll want to go ahead and talk about, so we've done um, employee and supervisor responsibilities, then we'll want to go ahead and talk about <clears throat> excuse me, the specific uh, prevention measures that you have implemented in your work site. And again, um, as Sarah and I mentioned, if you are still doing in-person operations, it is incredibly likely you are already doing all of these things. So now this is just an opportunity to document all of those things um, or, or refer to other protocols you've put in place if those already exist, having, having one document that can point somebody to all of the things you're already doing. So first, um, again, educating employees on protective behaviors and providing those employees with the necessary tools for those those protective behaviors. So hand hygiene, um, implementing uh, no touch uh, disposal receptacles for, for tissues, discouraging handshaking, um, you know, encouraging other, other methods of, of non-contact greeting, avoiding other employees' phones, desks, work tools, avoid sharing food and utensils, all of those pieces uh, that you're already doing developing protocol for social distancing practices. So encouraging employees to minimize ride sharing uh, while in vehicles, um, remind employees to maintain adequate ventilation, consider uh, providing um, additional PPE, use of mask, gloves, or other PPE um, for employees, and certainly develop, developing um, a more robust plan for employees who are in medium, high, or very high risk uh, categories. Of course, restricting employees from the work site if they display symptoms of COVID-19, and that's where um, those questionnaires or risk assessments um, can come in handy. So for those uh, of you who are already doing that, uh, either either by choice or, or by requirement, um, that's actually a handy, that comes in as a handy tool here, um, and you'll want to make sure you document uh, that in your plan, uh, because that certainly is a prevention measure that you are taking to, to minimize the spread in your workplace actively encouraging sick employees to stay home. And so that um, comes with making sure, again, you're, you're educating your staff on what the symptoms are look, look like and developing a protocol for how employees report those symptoms and actively encouraging employees to stay home if they've been in close contact with a confirmed or suspected uh, case of COVID-19. Next slide, please. 
So continuing some additional workplace prevention measures that you will want to mention um, in your plan. Um, again, you want to develop a protocol to follow if an employee has a confirmed case. That protocol doesn't necessarily have to be in that plan. It can exist in another document, but in your plan, you will want to refer um, to that protocol um, so that you, um, you, you know, we see that there are a number of protocols that can kind of ex exist as um, appendices or attachments to the plan, they, the details of which don't all need to, to live in the plan, but you do need to have something to point to. And again, um, last week, um, two of our colleagues did a, a whole webinar about what that protocol should look like. So I will point you back there um, for, for the nuts and bolts and the details on that, but that is a great resource as well. I also want to implement a protocol for return to work. So including uh, workplace con uh, contact tracing and the CDC recommended cleaning and disinfecting in all affected areas. So um, our previous webinar talks um, a little bit about, about that as well, kind of a holistic approach of, I've had an employee test positive, what, what is the life cycle of all of the things I need to be doing? So circling back to that and developing protocols um, that address all of those pieces. You'll want to, as we mentioned earlier, um, perform increased routine environmental cleaning and disinfection. Um, that was a, you know, obviously a recommendation from the CDC and from OSHA. And so here in your, your plan, you will just want to mention um, that you are doing those um, and, and, and provide information um, on what employee responsibilities may be in those areas. So if you are instructing employees to sanitize their work area upon arrival throughout the day or right before they leave, you'll want to include that in your plan. If you're doing routine cleaning of uh, high touch areas in the workplace, like workstations, keyboards, telephones, doorknobs, those pieces, you'll want to put that in your plan. If you're providing disposable wipes um, all throughout your organization um, and encouraging or requiring employees to wipe down um, those areas before use and immediately after use, right? Like I always think of uh, at the gym, right? So before you use a piece of equipment, you use the wipe and right after you use the wipe, that kind of a thing. So if you're doing that, put that in your plan. And then, of course, if you are using, um, you know, certain disinfectants um, that you're using on site, you'll want to uh, comply with your um, safety data sheet uh, requirements um, as well for those. Um, as we continue looking at the framework, eliminating or restricting work-related travel if possible and limiting employee exposure to returning travelers. So um, I think um, most of us on the call, right, uh, we're doing only uh, critically necessary types of travel, um, but certainly there may be um, persons who come back into our workplace who have traveled. And so you'll want to develop a protocol on, on the practice that you'll follow in those situations. So if you, um, there is work-related travel and that traveler is coming back to the work site, what is the protocol you're putting in place to ensure um, that individual's safety upon entering and uh, the safety of the rest of the coworkers? Next slide, please. Uh, You'll want to consider what kind of engineering controls you might be able to put in place. So here we're talking about potential increase um, to have the ability to increase ventilation rates. Do you have the ability to um, increase the percentage of outdoor air that is circulating into, into your air system and into your workplace? Those are things that, that you'll want to think about. And if you are doing them, um, or you have a protocol of when you should do them, go ahead and put those in your plan. You'll want to evaluate options for employees at higher risk for serious illness due to COVID-19. You'll want to um, provide um, provide information uh, to employees and have a mechanism uh, to, to to deal with employee accommodation requests um, that may fall into those uh, high risk areas um, because of their own um, because of their own uh, exposure um, or or health conditions. Again, we talked about planning to monitor and respond to absenteeism. So we want to um, you, you'll want to implement plans so that you can continue your essential business functions. Um, in the event that you do experience higher than usual absenteeism rates, and we talked about cross-training employees to perform those essential functions so your workplace can continue to operate even if key employees are absent. That's important. 
Also in your plan, you want to remind your employees of any employee assistance programs, that, uh, resources that you may have in place, and certainly community resources that exist um, at this time. Um, so uh, for, you know, short-term uh, resource, resource um, uh, connection, and um, making sure you're educating your employees about those pieces. And then again, communicating the importance, right, that sick employees should stay home. Um, if you've got that culture in your workplace, that's great, but you want to look at um, any other employees that you may share, right? So if you um, are dealing um, with a temporary help agency as, as one example, or you have kind of a shared staffing arrangement with another business organization, you're going to want to communicate um, the expectations in your workplace that sick employees stay home, communicate it to, to that business partner and encourage them, um, right, to, to have that same culture that, that their employees should not be reporting uh, to your work site if they are sick um, and working with that business partner um, uh, to be flexible on, on um, disciplinary actions and things such as that. Next slide, please. So the next piece of the framework we'll want to talk about, okay, so we've talked about the things we're doing in our work environment um, to minimize the spread. We've talked about the responsibility for our managers and our employees um, when they come to work in, in the additional uh, mitigation strategies we've taken. So now let's turn in our framework, we'll also want to talk about how are we going to minimize exposure to our customers. So again, if you're a work site who is continuing to have um, customers come into your work site, you'll want to talk about that. So first, you'll want to evaluate what business practices are needed to maintain um, critical, critical operations. And so you'll want to identify um, those, those pieces and continue those pieces as necessary so that you can continue to meet the requirements um, of your customers. Again, you'll want to develop protocol for social distancing practices. We talked about that a little bit. If, if you're an organization who has customers who are standing in line, you'll want to develop uh, protocols to ensure that your customers can maintain social distance from each other and from your staff similar to what you are doing, um, educating your own staff about reducing the spread of COVID-19. You'll want to have some of that information public facing um, so that you're also educating your customers on what they can do to reduce the spread. You'll want to evaluate options for assessing symptoms of COVID-19 and removing individuals from the workplace who, who exhibit symptoms. So we talked about potential assessments of your staff to make sure that they are not bringing um, COVID-19 into the workplace, you know, through an assessment or a questionnaire. It's a good time to think about if that makes sense um, for your customers as well. And if that's something that you are doing, you'll certainly want to put that in your plan. Considering physical barriers between employees and customers, so so by now, you know, one of the places we all can still go is the grocery store. Uh, so by now, we've all seen um, the the sneeze guards right at, at the checkout counters. So that's a perfect example um, of the physical barrier. And if you're doing anything like that, you'll certainly want to mention that in your plan. And considering uh, making additional uh, uh, gloves, mask available to to customers as well. Next slide, please. So as we talk about additional ways to minimize exposure, again, from, from vendors, again, talking to your business partners about your organization's plans. If needed, identify alternative supply chains for critical goods and services. If possible, limiting the number of visitors um, or vendors to the work site, looking at a way to, um, to, to minimize those uh, potential um, outside exposure uh, potential for your own workplace. Um, and just like we were talking about uh, with customers, consider developing a protocol um, for visitors and vendors as well. And then minimizing exposure from the general public. So you want to be prepared to change your business practices if needed to maintain critical operations. And so some of these OSHA requirements um, or components uh, contained in their guidance for what a good plan looks like. Um, some of us 
um, right? We've, we've already done all of these things just simply to comply with the executive orders here in our state. Um, so some of those, some of those things you've, you've already done, you've already done the assessment, right? And what your, what your critical operations are and the employees that are essential to those critical operations. Um, so you've done those pieces. So include that in your plan again. Um, next slide, please. Uh, you know, the general takeaway here is the good news is, is you've already done the work. So as you look at the work you've already done, um, start to assemble, right, um, all of those pieces of paperwork or all of the policies or protocols that you've issued or um, how, you've, how you've conducted some analysis on different things, uh, pull those all together so that they can be easily found in one place. So if you are asked, um, you are very, very quickly in compliance here. So this last uh, slide here is just uh, for your um, for, for your own resources, right? So we want to make sure that you have access to uh, the executive order, executive order 42, that specifically uh, links to the OSHA guidance. And we've included the link to the OSHA guidance there. We've also included the link to the CDC guidance for business and employers that talk a little bit more in detail about, um, about some of the uh, hygiene and, and uh, environmental controls and, and things that we've talked about. So, so these three pieces put together, um, relying upon those three things, um, are what we have used to propose our framework. And so we will provide to you as you think about yours. What questions have come in since we last? Yeah, um, quite a few. Let me take an easy one. And that is, um, will this presentation be available yet? Go on to um, the Miller Johnson COVID-19 um, website and the presentation will be up which is important, I know, for all of you because in those slides really can be the bullet points of your plan. The other thing I just want to make sure is very clear um, here is that a plan can include things that you might consider doing under certain circumstances. We are not saying that you now have to do all of the things on all of these slides that Sandy mentioned. Um, these are things that if it makes sense for your organization to include um, as a consideration within your plan, um, then, then put it in your plan in that spirit, right? Um, maybe we'll consider having masks and gloves available to employees if we come to that place. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do it right now just because it's in your plan. I hope that makes sense. Um, okay, another theme of questions that I saw um, were along the lines of, is, is this requirement going to go away when this executive order expires on April 30th? And I, I, I have to tell you, um, to answer that question, I've got, it, I've got to guess a little bit about what is going to happen. And I've, I've learned in the COVID-19 pandemic that um, sometimes I can make guesses and, and be wrong. <laughs> Things happen that we do not expect. But nonetheless, I, I will guess here. Um, I think that when the stay-at-home order expires on April 30th, and even assuming that it's not extended for longer, I do think Governor Whitmer is going to still have some social distancing measures in place and is going to require our businesses to have social distancing and other safety measures in their workplaces. So it wouldn't surprise me at all as business starts to open back up that Governor Whitmer tells all businesses in Michigan then that they also need to have a plan like that like this in place. So I don't think it's necessarily going to go away at the end of this month. A um, handful of questions about the workplace coordinator. Can it be somebody who's teleworking or working from home? Um, I think that's okay so long as there is um, a true and real opportunity um, for employees and others to get a hold of that person when they need to, and they're doing what they need to do under the plan. Um, can it be a task force instead of one person? Absolutely. I don't see any reason why it couldn't be a task force. 
Um, let's see what other questions we had. Um, choo -choo -choo. Does the workplace coordinator have personal liability? In other words, can they get sued personally for, for um, presumably not doing what they're supposed to do under the plan? Likely not. No, there wouldn't be a law that um, opens up lawsuits against, against that person. All right. There's just one, oh, one last question that I wanted to respond to is, um, will contracted healthcare workers follow the plan of the site where they are working? Which is a great question. And um, ideally, yes. Um, in that case, right, hopefully uh, the site where they are working will have implemented a plan and will have taken our advice to work with their business partners to make the plan available to them. In which case you would tell your healthcare workers, he, here is the plan that's available at your site um, so that you know, um, become familiar with it. Here's um, their plan for PPE, et cetera. Okay, well, I think that, that answers um, all the questions specific to this presentation. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we hope you have a, a great day and keep safe. And we will talk to you all uh, tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. again. Thanks. Bye-bye.